knowledge of our government, it was a tremendous shock. As the Fifth Estate was first to report in 1984, the work that Dr. Ewan Cameron oversaw at his Montreal clinic was shocking. Now the story of Cameron's experiments and the victim's struggle for justice have been made into a riveting movie to be broadcast on CBC television this Sunday and Monday nights. For the victims of the sleep room, the horror has never really ended. Even if you don't know the history of the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal, it looks like a natural setting for a movie. A horror movie, maybe. But then, the truth about what happened to hundreds of psychiatric patients there a long time ago is a horror story. Okay, so we're en route, guys. A piece of Leon. And now, it has become a movie a dramatized account of a bleak chapter in the history of Canadian psychiatry produced by a former Fifth Estate documentary maker, Bernard Zuckerman. Literally could not make change for a dollar. The central character in the TV movie is a world-renowned psychiatrist at the Allen in the early 60s. His name was Dr. Ewan Cameron. Dr. Cameron. It's the classic story of good turning to evil in its most simplistic terms. I mean, Dr. Cameron started off as someone who was probably one of the most enlightened psychiatrists in the country. But then something happened. And whatever happened, suddenly here is this enlightened doctor, this noble doctor, who begins doing more and more and more bizarre experiments on his patients to the point where he is destroying the minds of hundreds of people. These are the days and hours the Inspired by the exuberant post-war optimism in technology, Cameron thought he'd achieved a major scientific breakthrough, how to repair a damaged human mind. The media rejoiced, even coined a phrase which would become a tragically silly oxymoron, beneficial brainwashing. Linda McDonald was a young mother with five children under the age of five when she started feeling low. Her family doctor knew just the man to make her better. I was tired, I was depressed, my back was hurting. And so he said to the children's father, why don't you go to Montreal and visit this Dr. Ewan Cameron, this famous man who has all of these accolades, and have an assessment. So we went. My medical file even says that I took my guitar with me. And uh, that was the end of my life. Within three weeks, Dr. Cameron decided to call me an acute schizophrenic and ship me up to the sleep room. How long did they put you to sleep for? I was in a, a, a coma for 86 days. 86, 86 days of unbroken comatose, sleep. Yeah. Total comatose state. The theory was simple. Erase a disturbed mind and start all over again. One of Dr. Cameron's colleagues at the time was Dr. Peter Roper. The aim, I think, really was to wipe out the patterns of thought and behavior which were detrimental to the patient, which were sick, and replace them with healthy patterns of thought and behavior. I think this may have been um, stimulated by the effects of the uh, American prisoners of war in Korea, how they seem to have been brainwashed. And action the movie called The Sleep Room dramatizes one technique for brainwashing. Extreme sessions of electroshock therapy, massive jolts of electricity three or four times a day for weeks. According to her hospital records, Linda McDonald had 100 of these treatments. She entered hospital for treatment of what we can now guess was postpartum depression. Her records show the results of shock and radical drug therapy. May 15th shows some confusion. June 3rd knows her name, but that's about all. June 11th doesn't know her name. I was, had to be toilet trained. I was a vegetable. I had no identity, I had no memory, I'd never existed in the world before. A, like a baby. Just like a baby that has to be toilet trained. She eventually went home, her depression gone, and her entire previous life gone with it. 
And this is this is one of the twins. In, 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 it was in 62 before I went to the island. And this is the same one, I think. I just look at the pictures and I know who that is, who they are. But I don't remember them as my children at all. Hmm. I mean, I know that they came from my body. Um, but there's no... Th that's all. I don't know, and that's because I was told that. Hmm. So these are my children. Robert Logie was little more than a child himself when he was referred to Dr. Cameron. He was 18. He had a sore leg. His doctor thought it was all in his head and sent him to the Allen. Like Linda McDonald, he went through a nightmare of shock therapy and drugs, including LSD. Well, I was given LSD about every second day and uh, injected and uh, it, sometimes it was mixed with sodium amytal and other drugs. Idiot part one on one take two. Yep. Most of the drugs were experimental but seemed suitable for brainwashing or as Cameron preferred to call it, depatterning. Then during the long sleep, the patient would be forced to listen to subliminal messages that were supposed to print new, sometimes bizarre thoughts on his blank mind. I was aware of the speaker under my pillow. I was aware of the words. Which were? You killed your mother. You killed your mother. Yeah. Who was alive and well. Who was alive and well. And, uh, Over and over again, this voice is uh, coming. Well, like I say, it takes about two seconds to say that message. And this was going on for 23 days. And, uh, when I went home, after being there and when I went home, my mother was there and why was she there and it <laughs> didn't make any sense. So what was going on here? Dr. Ewan Cameron was at one point head of the World Psychiatric Association and is still admired by some of his former colleagues, Dr. Peter Roper. What is the possibility that we had a, a good, well-motivated man whose ego and ambition took charge of his professionalism and led him into some fairly dark places. Hmm. Well, I would put that chance as pretty slight. I think it's more likely that um, if he'd been around to defend himself when this story came out, uh, we'd have a, a totally different picture of it. What would he say? Put yourself in his shoes. What would he say? Uh, I think he'd say, uh, look, I treated these patients to the best of my ability. I, uh, I didn't get all of them well, but most of them I got better than they were. A travesty, I agree. But in the movie, Dr. Cameron will not come off so well. They're your patients. Most of these people were discharged as cured. It accurately shows that many of his patients, inaccurately diagnosed as schizophrenics, were permanently damaged by his methods. Eventually, even Cameron had doubts about his experiments. He left the Allen in 1964, died of a heart attack three years later. By then, the hospital had quietly abandoned the experiments. Destroy these people for nothing. You can't just walk away from this, Cameron! Nobody knows for sure exactly how many people Dr. Cameron and his colleagues exposed to the program of chemical and electroshock treatment they called depatterning and psychic driving, a process which some experts have since called barbaric. But many years would pass before there would be any public or official acknowledgement of what those damaged patients had been through. It would take a dramatic disclosure in the late 70s that the Allen Memorial had been part of a Cold War program of brainwashing experiments, paid for in part by the CIA. Hidden among its most sensitive files were CIA records documenting a project called MK Ultra. Between 1957 and 1961, a CIA front funneled about $62,000 US for brainwashing research by Dr. Ewan Cameron. The American media got the story first but the Fifth Estate exposed the magnitude of the human tragedy. 
Experimental drugs, including LSD, were administered to human guinea pigs. The patients were never told that their treatment was part of a CIA experiment. I don't think we'll have radishes. One of those patients was Velma Orlico of Winnipeg. She'd been at the Allen in the late 50s for treatment of depression. She happened to be married to a member of parliament, David Orlico of the NDP. She'd considered Dr. Cameron a near saint. Now she was being told she'd been betrayed by him. It was an awful feeling to realize when I found this out that the man whom I had thought cared about what happened to me didn't give a damn. I was a fly, just a fly. First, she felt hurt. Then she got angry and decided to sue one of the most powerful institutions in the world, the CIA. As a matter of fact, when she said she wanted to sue the CIA, I said, you're crazy. How can a couple, how can a hick from Winnipeg sue the CIA? But she did along with eight other former patients, a massive lawsuit that would consume many years and become an obsession for a distinguished American civil liberties lawyer named Joseph Rao. Cameron, all he did was what the CIA was in effect asking him to do, yeah, and what he said he was going to do, and he did it. Rao and a young assistant named James Turner knew they were up against a formidable opponent in the CIA, but they thought the odds would be evened a bit by help from a natural ally. They were in for a disappointment. But we expected to have a very potent ally in the form of the Canadian government. And unfortunately, instead of helping their own citizens because the Canadian government was worried about its possible liability, uh, the Mulroney government, in effect, stabbed its citizens in the back at every turn in the litigation. Ottawa actually helped suppress a key piece of information, evidence that CIA officials at the U.S. Embassy had actually apologized to the Canadian government when the CIA experiments were first revealed. Jim Turner is still flabbergasted. You've got to understand how important these apologies and expressions of regret were. This is an admission. This is legally admissible in court because it is one of the parties of the litigation saying, I did something wrong and I'm sorry I did it. That is prima facie evidence of negligence and of wrongdoing that goes a long, long way to bringing the case to a, a timely conclusion instead of the protracted 10 years of litigation that we had. And action. Mr. Mulrooney. The movie underscores the impact of Ottawa's refusal to give the lawyers details of the CIA apology. The lawyers eventually upped the ante on the Fifth Estate. And action. Tonight on the Fifth Estate, startling revelations about the activities of the CIA in Canada. With the publicity wave gathering momentum and the strength of the victim's case becoming more apparent, the CIA caved in the day before the trial was to begin. They settled out of court for $750,000. At the time, it was the largest settlement the CIA had ever awarded, and it provides a dramatic finale for the movie. Because we made them <laughs> They couldn't beat us. We won. You break that down. Producer Bernard Zuckerman says, besides the financial terms, this was a major moral victory. Here you've got nine little Canadian victims taking on probably the most powerful institution in America, the CIA. And these little Canadians, they win. They get the CIA to settle and give them money and, in effect, an apology saying what we did is wrong. The movie ends with a CIA settlement, but the story didn't end there. Troubling questions would persist, especially about the government of Canada. So why was Ottawa so ambiguous when it came to helping some Canadian citizens get compensation from Washington for what they endured in a program that was inspired mostly by American Cold War fears? Well, the answer was simple. The government of Canada was even more deeply involved in the Allen Memorial experiments than the Americans. Dr. Cameron's experiments were funded to the tune of half a million dollars by the Federal Department of Health and Welfare during the 50s, and the funding didn't stop then. They kicked in over $51,000 after the CIA project ended in 1961, which was when a young, stressed-out mother named Linda McDonald became part of the Allen Memorial story. When she discovered that her own government had been funding brainwashing experiments on her, she made a dramatic decision. 
You decided to take on the government of Canada. You oh, did. sure. Well, hey, considering what I'd already been through, that was a snap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what else? Why not? It must have become obvious to you fairly quickly that you were ramming your head into a brick yes, wall. Yes, yes. I'm stubborn, too. It got to the point where every time, whether it was John Crosby or uh, Raina Titian or then the, the Honorable Kim Campbell, it got to be, uh, you guys, we're going we're gonna to stay alive. I, and I said that to Brian Mulroney, too. If you think I'm going away, you've got another thing coming. I'm not going to go away. <laughs> I finally discovered... Uh, Linda MacDonald would hound the federal government for four years before finally, in 1992, Ottawa grudgingly agreed to compensate her and some of Dr. Cameron's other victims $100,000 each in exchange for signing away the right to sue the government or the hospital. But it was an ambiguous victory. Ottawa refused to acknowledge any wrongdoing at the Allen, a conclusion backed up by a legal review of what happened there. The report by a prominent progressive conservative lawyer relied partly on expert advice from Dr. Frederick Grunberg, one of Quebec's leading psychiatrists who made two controversial assertions, that patients hadn't suffered irreparable harm and that they had consented to the treatment. Well, what I meant is that uh, the patient who admitted at uh, the Allen Memorial uh, Institute uh, were patients who went in voluntarily. So the sort of consent they gave is uh, what was uh, what done uh, was a sort of general consent uh, to the hospital, the sort of consent that was given for surgery or for mm -hmm. any other uh, procedure. Consent had nothing to do with it. Dr. Cameron did not describe the treatment. He did not clarify. He did not give any way, shape, or form any kind of a hint of what was going to happen. That's not consent. And I don't even know whether he talked to me because I'll never remember anyway. Dr. Grunberg shares a widely held view in his profession about the legacy of Dr. Ewan Cameron. I think he was a misguided man. He worked on a sort of a poor theoretical uh, basis, and I think he was imprudent, uh, considering. But I am convinced, and I'm still convinced, that uh, he really wanted a therapeutic made through. He, he had this motivation that he was going to break this uh, terrible uh, condition. You seem to be saying the things that Cameron did were awful, but he meant well, so we'll forgive him. And the, the victims are, or the patients will have to live with the country. It's not a question of forgiving. As I say, uh, uh, the thing is, we, 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 we put what he was doing in the, pers in the perspective of his, of his time. And a lot of awful things what going on? A lot of people are saying, considering the accepted practice and the science available at the time, this was an appropriate thing to do to you. What? It wasn't treatment, uh, if that's what you're suggesting. It wasn't treatment for anything, not a toenail and or, or uh, anything. It, it was out and out guinea pigs for brainwashing experiments. That's what it was. It's been more than 33 years since the Allen put an end to the practices initiated by its most notorious doctor. It has recovered its world-class reputation as a leader in the treatment of mental illness. Dr. Peter Roper was dismissed from the Allen two years after Dr. Cameron left. One of the reasons, he insisted on following Dr. Cameron's technique. Did you argue strenuously to, to continue the depatterning of your patients? Well, I felt that I had a duty to my patients to give them the best possible treatment. And if there were some that were not responding to any other form of treatment, the only thing left was the patterning for them, then I felt that it should be done. You, you, sound, you sound almost nostalgic for the 50s and 60s. Oh, no, it's not nostalgia. It's, it's a question that I think that bothers a lot of doctors, but it's rather sad if they're prevented from having that treatment because of administrative 
political or other reasons which had nothing to do with good medical practice. Mm -hmm. For Linda McDonald, good medical practice in 1963 turned an emotional crisis into a horror that would haunt a lifetime. Oh, here we are. This feels strange. This spring, she returned to the Ottawa High School where she graduated in 1957. Hi, yeah. Linda. I'm Ann Argue Highland. How are you? Oh, uh, hi. Hi. Uh, I don't know if you remember. I don't, and, I don't and remember at all. No, I guess not. <laughs> and all of these people, we knew all of these people. She has no memory of this place or those times or even of who she was back then. Oh, here I am. Look at, look at me. They, did they call me Lindy? Yeah. I am who I am today. My family tells me that I am very much like the Linda that they knew when I was growing up. Gregarious, always talking.